How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Well, it's Friday here on this program, and you know what that means. we got a busy weekend coming up with the AEW New Japan Forbidden Door pay-per-view, which is coming up on Sunday. And you, I'm sure, dear listener, will be stunned to hear there's another injury that is that has afflicted this show. Tomohiro Ishii is off the show. He has been replaced in the All-Atlantic 4-Way by Clark Connors, who Ishii beat. So uh, we'll go over the full card for the show. And uh, I won't go over everything I went over yesterday in the Brian and Vinny show. If you want to uh, listen to the show, wrestlingobserver.com, video.f4wonline.com, you can. But uh, the gist of it is, I went through this card, and uh, based on what I know, whether it be injuries or politics or changes as a result of injuries which changed other matches, if that makes sense, I think every single solitary match on this show with the exception of Thunder Rosa versus Tony Storm, was originally going to be something else. Nine out of ten matches ended up being changed from what they originally wanted to do. So anyway, we'll go over that. We have got the uh, AEW ratings, which were up this week, and we've also got an update on the SmackDown and Rampage numbers last week, which, if you recall, Rampage was, like, so low that people were thinking maybe there was an issue at Nielsen. And in fact, the good news is there was an issue at Nielsen. It affected both SmackDown and Rampage. The bad news is Rampage still did a horrible number. So we'll tell you about that here today. We've also got an update on Stephanie McMahon, SmackDown tonight, new NXT tag team champions, a virgin is a title holder, and so much more. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back on the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Simber, BB, also of WrestlingObserver.com. And yes, a she has been pulled from Forbidden Door after suffering a knee injury. And bro, if you know anything about Ishii, it's got to be a bad knee injury to pull out of a show. He'd been scheduled to take part in the AEW All-Atlantic title match featuring Pac, Miro, and Malachi. He will be replaced by Clark Connors, who is the guy that he defeated in a tournament final on Tuesday at the New Japan Road event in Tokyo. You know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Clark Connors. No Clark, he worked around here, and uh, he actually worked at the pool that Vinny's wife works at before he uh, got into wrestling. So I'm very, very happy to see uh, Clark Connors. Uh, he did the uh, uh, elderly people water yoga. And boy, do they like Clark Connors. But anyway... Uh, he, uh, I'm very happy to see him working this Forbidden Door show. But man, this was an opportunity to get old Filthy Tom in that four-way. And it didn't happen. But, well, he'll be in the G1, right? right? He will be. Yes, sir. So another injury. And, uh, as I noted earlier here today, yesterday it was like seven of the matches had been changed as a result of, uh, injury or whatever. But I, I did a tally yesterday. And uh, whether it be injury politics or someone being moved because of an injury and needed to be replaced in a match, uh, by my count, nine of the ten matches, for sure, uh, were changed from what was originally planned. The only one that I think had been planned from the beginning and is taking place as planned, provided none of these two get hurt, is Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm for the AW World Women's title. Every single other match was changed for one reason or another from what they had originally planned, which is insane when you actually think about it. We've got uh, Moxley Tanahashi, as we're all well aware, Jay White, Okada, Hangman, and Adam Cole. We've got uh, Malachi, Pac, Miro, and Clark Connors for the All-Atlantic title, Thunder Rosa, Tony Storm, Jeff Cobb and Great Khan versus FTR versus Rapongi Vice, winner take all, ROH and IWGP tag team titles. Will Ospreay, Orange Cassidy, Jericho, Suzuki, Sammy versus Eddie Kingston, Wheeler, Yuta, and Shoto Amino. Zack Sabre Jr. versus the Mystery Man, whoever that might be. Young Bucks, Fantasmo, and Hikaleo versus Sting, Darby, Shingo, and Hiromu Takahashi. And then the buy-in is Max Caster and the Gun Club versus the LA Dojo. So that is the lineup for the show. I still think it's going to be an excellent show, bell to bell. 
But I know a lot of people are disappointed. Some people are claiming they're not going to buy it. It's kind of funny because whenever people go, I don't like it, I'm not going to buy it. Yeah, I never believe that because I've heard that a thousand times. And then we end up getting numbers and it's like the number of people that actually said that they didn't buy it is low. So like they either weren't going to buy it in the first place or, you know, the people that actually legitimately changed their minds, it's usually very, very few people. But uh, it was funny when people go like, well, I expect it to be great, but I didn't like the build. <laughs> what? So you're going to skip out on a show that you know is going to be great because you don't know how they, you don't like how they got to the show that's going to be great. That was one, that was a weird one, but whatever. Well, I think do most, whatever you want. most of those people that would say that are going to buy the show anyway. You know, I think the only time the build hurts is any casual fan that is not a diehard New Japan fan slash AEW pro wrestling fan. If they only follow AEW, yeah, the build will matter to them. But most of the people that are frustrated or probably expressing that opinion, and I don't know, your timeline tends to be a little bit more toxic than mine. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't believe those people at all. <laughs> they're, they're absolutely going to watch the show. What, is she's not going to be there? So all of a sudden you're not going to watch the show? No. Is Okada in the dream match that you want him to be in? Is Tanahashi is whoever? Maybe not. Is that really going to stop you from watching the show? No, because you know whoever Zack Sabre Jr. faces could be, say it's Cesaro, say it's Gargano, say it's whoever it is. It's probably going to be pretty great. <laughs> you know, you look up and down and you go, is Cassidy the guy I would have wanted to face Will Ospreay? Probably not. But you know what? The match itself is probably going to be pretty great. Same goes for, for Tanahashi and Moxley. I would have loved for it to be Punk, but this is the hand we're dealt. And I think by the time Sunday night is over with, there are going to be people who some people don't know, like a Clark Connors, because for the most part, people don't know who the hell Clark Connors is. People listening to this show may, but there's a lot of wrestling fans that don't. And I think they're going to see him. They're going to see El Fantasmo. They're going to see some of these other guys, and they're going to be really surprised, and they're going to want to see those guys more in AEW and mixing it up. And again, this is step one on what hopefully is going to be a long path of working together between these two groups. By the way, for this guy that says, I know 100% Tanashi stands less than 0% chance of winning, will I watch it? Yes. I would not say that at all. I don't think he's got 0% chance of winning or less. At all. That's I'm low. not necessarily predicting him, but uh, yeah. that is not a... By the way, a, uh, after that, everyone that, freaked out... Oh, well, hold on. That's one of the interesting things, too, and I, we can get into it later on if we go up and down this card, where the one thing that's for sure is you don't know in some of these cases who is actually going to come out the winner. I mean, there's a lot of question. You know, you may think, okay, this person is going to this side is going to win, but you don't know who's going to take the fall, and I think there's a lot of stories that could be developed for both companies coming out of this show. So last week, everybody was freaking out about these numbers. And uh, Dynamite Wednesday, 878,000 viewers, up 15.4% from last week. Number one on cable with an 0.31, which was up 10.7% from last week. This was up against the Stanley Cup Finals, which did 4.6 million viewers. And a 1.31 in 18 to 49. Up in every demo category, except males 12 to 34, which declined. Biggest increases were young women. Females 12 to 34 up 100%. 18 to 49 up 43.8%. So, uh, number's good. So, we can move on from that one. But, due to a reporting <laughs> error with Nielsen, because these numbers on Friday, I mean, it was bizarre. SmackDown was sky high. Rampage was like depths of the earth. And uh, it turns out that there was a reporting error at Nielsen, which affected both shows. So uh, SmackDown, uh, as opposed to doing 2.29 million viewers, they did 2.389 million, which means that Roman Reigns riddle match that did uh, 2.8 million, it probably did actually almost 3 million viewers for Roman Reigns versus Riddle. The same riddle that they squashed on Monday with Omas and beat him up twice in one show. The Rampage show uh, actually ended up doing 369,000 viewers, 
which was up 12% from what we reported last week. That's the good news. The bad news is, in its normal time slot, still by far the lowest viewership ever in the history of Rampage. That did allow it to beat two of the shows that were preempted, but uh, this in no way turned the Rampage number into a good number. It's still at a .12 at 18 to 49, uh, which I guess is good because before it was a .10. This is at least a .12, but that is also the lowest demo number the show has ever done in uh, its regular time slot. But it did yeah, that, beat some shows that were preempted. So it, there but there's go. minimal spin you can put on that that, that makes it a positive. No, it, sucked. The, it was a horrible only, number. Yeah, the only spin you can put on it is, you know, this is better than some of the times they've been preempted and put somewhere else. But they only went up, you know, 38,000 viewers in this when in SmackDown went up 900,000. So... People well, just, it's for whatever reason, wise, obviously. No, but as far as, yeah, but it goes up, you know, they went up to nearly 2.4 million people from 2.29. And again, because of that percentage, you know, it, yeah, it, it just unfortunately doesn't go up enough for Rampage at all. And was it a one week aberration? The show has been on a decline anyway. They are hamstrung by the fact that there are days that they don't want to run on and issues that they have that Tony Khan either has a gentleman's agreement with or there's some other deeper reason that he doesn't want to run on certain days up against certain shows but they're hurting themselves that way because you got to get that show off of friday at 10 i don't know where you can put it what you can do but friday at 10 stinks back in a moment observer live back in the show brian alvarez here wrestling observer live mike sempervivi also wrestling observer.com okay everyone's talking about tanahashi what percentage so, chance do I think the Tanahashi has of winning? Bro, I don't know. And you know what I would do? I would say 50%. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because what was the originally scheduled match? It was CM Punk versus Hiroshi Tanahashi for the AEW title, right? That was the original match. Yes. CM Punk got hurt, and he was removed from that match. Okay? So... Tony clearly wanted to see CM Punk versus Hiroshi Tanahashi for the AEW title. Well, now he can't because CM Punk got hurt. Unless you either bring back Tanahashi later when CM Punk ends up champion again, or Tanahashi wins the title, CM Punk comes back, and it all out, you do the match he wanted to do in the first place that couldn't do, CM Punk versus Hiroshi Tanahashi for the AEW title, and CM Punk wins. So it's not like this has happened before, where something throws a monkey wrench in Tony's plans, and he swerves to get back to where he was going originally. So if he really wanted to do that match, then Tanahashi wins the interim title, and when Punk comes back, you do Punk and Tanahashi, the originally planned match, and then Punk gets to win. Now, I explained that. Well, why did I say 50%? Well, the other half of that 50% is that if CM Punk would have wrestled Hiroshi Tanahashi at Forbidden Door, I don't think Tanahashi is winning. He was going to lose at Forbidden Door. So that's the other 50%. He wasn't scheduled to win, so he's probably, maybe, 50% not going to win this time. But for anybody thinking that Tanahashi has zero chance of winning the AEW title, if you look at history and the way that Tony has handled issues where he couldn't put together a match he wanted to do, he does his little swerve to get back to the match he wanted to do in the first place. So don't think there's zero chance. I haven't actually gone and looked at the, uh, at the schedule for G1. But well, there, uh, here's every, the flaw. There's the well, flaw hold on. in what you're... <laughs> hold on. Okay. Everyone is doing six matches and not eight, okay? And I was told that there is only one Wednesday where Hiroshi Tanahashi is working a G1 match, which means with the exception of one Wednesday, he is available. It would be a tough flight there and back, but he could appear every Wednesday except one during the G1. So it's not impossible that he could win this title. 
It's not impossible, but it's highly unlikely because of the G1. And I think if you wanted, if you were a gambler that way and say, I'm going to put money on Tanahashi, I think then you also must look at the odds on the Okada match. Because if you look at Jay White, Okada, Page, and uh, Adam Cole, you have three AEW guys, or two AEW guys, Jay White and Okada. And if you're going to switch the belt and actually have Tanahashi hold on to the AEW title throughout the G1, you know, leading into, I don't, I don't know when All Out is, but, you know, if you're going to have that happen, then go ahead and actually swap the belts and have Hangman Page pull off a big upset so he could have a big match when he goes over to Japan. I, I think, I, again, I, I know what you're saying, and, I, and I, I, I see that. I just see this is where politics start to dribble back in and, you know, the importance of those titles, which while G1 is going on, you wouldn't think would be important and doesn't – most fans would go, okay, I can displace this and, and put it in this part of my mind, but I don't know if the companies necessarily want that to be the case. And well, you know, the travel thing. back and forth with Tanahashi, I think that is asking – that's asking a lot. Well, he doesn't have to be there for every show. Certainly not. I mean, no. he doesn't have to do every single Wednesday that he's available. He could do a couple of videos, but he could appear. He's not. My point is, he is not for sure off AEW for six weeks if he's in the G1. He could make appearances. He could defend the title on Dynamite. And here's the thing. With the G1, uh, uh, virtually every single time, there is somebody that beats the IWGP heavyweight champion during G1 to set up a match post G1. I think the champion, I think the IWGP champion needs to work the G1. So you could have Jay White retain the title. You could have Okada win the title from Jay White. Maybe, maybe the whole reason that Jay White won the title was so Okada, Okada could win it back on Forbidden Door. But if you're talking about politics, if Tanahashi wins the AEW title, the swap does not need to be an AEW guy winning the IWGP heavyweight title. FTR can win the IWGP tag team titles. So the New Japan belts that come over here are the world tag team titles, and the AEW title that goes over there but also stays here because Tanahashi could work shows would be the IW or the uh, AEW championship. So you can make this work with the G1 and with uh, a political both sides get one belt. You could do that. I still believe that Moxie is probably going to win, despite everything I just said. But the, the, I'm just pointing out, it, it is not beyond the realm of possibility that Hiroshi Tanahashi wins the AEW title. It's not less than 0% at all. No, not a, not a, not at all. Not at all. And I, I, if I had to put money on it, I'm probably putting it on Moxley. And I'm putting it on Jay White as well, too, getting... I can see more of Jay White trying to start his own group or having more, you know, of the Bullet Club storyline being involved because of Cole and Page all involved in that, too. And Okada somehow getting screwed out of this uh, because I just now that you've taken it off Okada and put it on White, to me now it's the build for Okada and... He can win it back before January 4th, but I can see a story and I can see possibly where that title stays out of his grasp until the end of the year, until those January 4th shows. But but who knows? We got a long way to go. And Sunday, we got to get out of the way first. And there's enough matches that we can go through without having to fantasy book out too much. This week's Observer, Dave Meltzer reported the decision to appoint Stephanie as the interim WWE CEO and chairwoman not the women's chairman you're working too hard for that one was done by a special committee of the company's board that did not include her family members or nick khan last friday wwe announced stephanie this is the greatest story of all time wwe uh, announced that stephanie would replace her father vince on an interim basis as company's ceo and chairwoman as a special committee investigation is underway 
regarding alleged misconduct related to a $3 million hush fund given to a former employee-slash-love interest. While he made that move voluntarily, he still remains head of creative and made brief appearances on both last Friday's SmackDown and Monday's Raw. Brian Gewertz uh, had an idea on Twitter. He said if he had any say in this, he'd have Vince come out and do a shorter and shorter appearance on every single show from here on out. Just a surprise appearance where he like plugs WWE shop and then throws a the mic and leaves. And I would not rule out another appearance by Vince on Friday after the numbers they had this past week. Dave wrote, Stephanie McMahon being put in power was said to be based on a decision of a special committee, which would be the eight members of the board that were not Nick Khan, Vince McMahon, Stephanie, or Paul Levesque. Regarding an unflattering story that I can't even keep a straight face. Regarding an unflattering story that came out in Business Insider about Stephanie taking a leave of absence in May, Meltzer wrote that, quote, of the side of the company that buried her on the way out, none of that came from the members of the special committee, but from others in the company. So the point of all of this is, do you remember when we were pointing out, well, she left, and then first they buried her privately, and then they buried her publicly, and then they just brought her back. Well, that's the simplistic way of looking at it. What happened was she left. They buried her privately. They buried her publicly. And then the board that didn't bury her brought her back. So, man, if they find out some of the folks that were burying Stephanie McMahon and now she's back. This is who incredible. Do th- who, who do you think those folks were that buried Stephanie? Well, I mean, I know, uh, I mean, it's not like a big secret, but uh, it's one of those things where like, you know, they were clearly instructed to get word out. Now, who instructed them? That I don't know. They, they, that the I don't thing. know. Who, who, who is it? But, uh, you know, the, the, that people that, the people that actually got the word out, this would be a case of, of killing the messenger. But I mean. So then Why? What what was what would have been what was the benefit then in doing that, knowing that he's she is still Vince McMahon's daughter, knowing that there is still power to be wielded by a woman who's going to be on the board of that company until the end of time, or unless she pulls a Shane, what was the benefit? What was what was the goal of it other than to try to kick dirt on somebody that very likely would have been back in some form after taking this time off that Dave says she did voluntarily. So what what was the end game well, for these folks? Well, so we talked about this the other day. The the best theory that anyone has given me is that when they when she left, they were concerned that the stock price was going to fall because a McMahon had left the company. And so their theory was, well, if we say that she wasn't good at the job and we have hired better people to do the job, well, then the stock price won't tank. Okay. Now, I don't know if that's true. All right. That's just the best theory that I've heard. But what's funny is, (laughs) if that is true, if that is true, that in order to keep the stock price stable, you said that she sucked at her job, but now she's been brought back for an even higher ranking position. Well, that would tank the stock now, wouldn't it? Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back at the show, Brian Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. We're going to have time for uh, for your feedback here today. So text me, 425-780-7566. 425-780-7566. Brian at WrestlingObserver.com. At Brian Alvarez on Twitter, at Sempervivi. F4W online on Cameo. Get your uh, beach cameos today. I'm going to be doing some tonight, so get your order in now for a Pacific Ocean View beach cameo. Here from lovely Cannon Beach, Oregon. Saw a listener the other day. I was heading into the Mariner Market, and he ran into me. Brian Alvarez, Observer Live! He lives here in Cannon Beach. We had a nice conversation. Talked about pizza. Nice Mexican joint over there in Seaside. Mm. Super nice guy. Hopefully I see him again. Where and does you he come everybody. down on pizza? Where does he come down on pizza? Well, there's a there's a really good pizza feta place. But he had bought a pizza at the Mariner Market. And then he bought wow. it and he kind of regretted it. He was like, I should have got pizza feta. But I said, bro, you live here. You can get pizza feta anytime you want. So anyway, maybe I'll get that here sometime soon. After I'm done with my four-day fast. 
Oh, look at you. So Four day fast. Why? Why would you do that to yourself on vacation? I was so fat and bloated. It was disgusting. <laughs> but I feel much better now. And I have not fasted for four days. But anyway, I want to mention, hey, you guys ever heard what? of Talk is Jericho? I'm on it. Along with Lance and, as it says in the description, Big Vinny V. We did a special edition of Talk is Jericho talking about classic wrestling albums. Remember Pile Driver? I had to listen to all these albums again to do this show. So it's a very, very fun show. If you want to check it out, Talk is Jericho. It's up right now. So head up there and check that out, everybody. What's so funny, Mike, that you finally weren't got, invited? Finally well, of got course you weren't invited. related in your wheelhouse that you could actually talk about wacky songs. Oh, my God. What do you want me to go books? in there and talk about? Bigfoot? I could do that. <laughs> UFOs? Well, I know Chris is big into conspiracy Sasquatch? theories from what I've heard, so that would be perfect for you to jump on there and talk about with him. Hey, by the way, did you know the Virgin won the NXT Tag Team titles? I heard, I heard that, yes. Josh Briggs and Brooks Jensen. Have Virgin will travel. The NXT UK Tag Team titles. So, uh, good for them. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll get some action now. He should take a picture of himself with that belt, but like no, no one else. Just him, the belt, and his hand. <laughs> Jesus, bro, that's the that's the gimmick. Yeah, what? Hold on a second, Mike. You watch I, this show. Why I are know. you mad at me? That's literally the gimmick. The gimmick was that he had so furiously. Uh, pleasured himself. My kids are downstairs. That he broke his hand. That was the storyline. He was in a cast for that very reason. And of all people, you're ducking your head because I'm making some statement about an actual angle on WWE television. I'm not making it up. I'm not calling him a virgin to make fun of him. That's literally his character. That is literally his character. They said, they literally said on television, on commentary, that this guy had been so backed up for 21 years he was ready to explode. They said that on television. You're well, mad at me? Apparently. You're like one of the people on my Twitter, in my whatevers, mentions. Do you know how hypocritical you are? Do you know how hypocritical you are? No, I you don't. You're I don't understand. Because You're right. You don't understand. Because I am not hysterical. I am not angry right now. You just talked about a guy that's been so backed up for so long that he is losing his mind and actually hurt himself furiously masturbating. I mean, let's just say I don't, I don't have any kids that are impressionable around. I'll just say it for you out loud. That's what you're saying, Brian Alvarez. You, you, sir sound a little bit like you may be backed up and a little hysterical right now. Are you suffering bro, from some of the same bro, issues you're that that young boy is? You're are, you, are you suffering from that? Because we saw you try to replace and do whatever you were doing yesterday uh, with trying to get the tie line back on, and we saw that arm that you had there, and it was kind of looking like when Quagmire on Family Guy discovered the Internet. You know what I'm saying? It was you, looking I have no idea what you're saying. It what I know is so maybe you're it's questioning, you who are so frustrated and upset. You're questioning me calling him a virgin. When he walked out on TV four weeks ago with a shirt that said, and I quote, virginity rocks. Brian, so I don't want to hear about it. Brian, I am actually 100% not questioning that at all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Io Shirai and Zoe Stark are expected to return from injury relatively soon. So if you're wondering where Io Shirai and Zoe Stark were, they were hurt. Not Io masturbation Sh related. We don't know that. Well, I don't know about mm -hmm. Zoe, but I know that Io it wasn't. She did a uh, moonsault at the last, uh, whatever the last pay-per-view was that she worked, mm -hmm. which I guess would have been uh, stand and deliver April 2nd. Mm -hmm. Apparently she did a uh, moonsault and she hit the announce table. So well, that's where she got with, injured. Because that'll, that'll determine a lot. And then uh, Zoe Stark has not wrestled since Halloween Havoc in October. Has it been that long? Yeah. She had a torn a ACL time. and meniscus and got surgery, so she should be back soon. They need her there. <laughs> she is very, very, They very need a sound. lot of people there. Well, they, they do indeed. And they both, both of them coming back would help matters out immensely because I don't want to see any more Alba Fire Lash Legend matches. I just don't. This person is saying, basically, Mike is saying that your one forearm is way bigger than the other. You want to know something funny? You want to know something funny? <laughs> did he also make a drawing for you to explain it? 
Yes, go ahead. My right forearm oh, no. is way bigger than my left. You want me to tell you why? Sure. Furiously lifting weights when I was young. So what happened was, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'll am gonna. i digress. It's a Friday. Yeah, you want to know what happened? So right. I, uh, this would have been, uh, I would have been in uh, fifth or sixth grade when I started watching wrestling, okay? And uh, I was a big fan of the Ultimate Warrior. So uh, I got into seventh grade, and I've been watching wrestling for uh, a few years. And uh, very early in seventh grade, we did uh, whatever, you know, it actually might have been sixth grade. It might have been in PE. But regardless, we had to do shirts and skins basketball, okay? And uh, I was very skinny. I was, uh, I'll just put it this way. I was 100 and 16 pounds when I got my driver's license. That was when I was 16. So imagine five years earlier. I was so skinny, and I'd take my shirt off. And so we're doing shirts and skins basketball. And uh, yes, it's true. I had a chicken chest. Now, the difference was I was 11 with a chicken chest and not in my 30s. But anyway, so I had a chicken chest. And uh, so what I did, I went home, and my dad had a guy that uh, worked for his fence company. And uh, this sounds kind of weird, but <laughs> we, had a, uh, we had a shed in the backyard, and he lived there because he had been down on his luck, okay? But inside his shed that he lived in, which actually was a nice shed, it was furnished, <laughs> bed, everything, he had a weight set. And uh, so and I a said, bunch you know, of gimmicks from Tijuana that he can I, uh, <laughs> can I uh, work out with those weights? So uh, anyway, I started working out with the weights, okay? And uh, I had been working out with the weights for about uh, maybe six months or whatever. And, you know, I was making progress because, you know, I was 11, 12 years old lifting weights. You're going to immediately make progress. And I decided they had the list of, uh, no, it's nothing like that, uh, Jingu. But anyway, so uh, they had a list of after-school sports, okay? And uh, I decided I am going to go out for the tennis team. Never played tennis in my life. I didn't even know what it was. So I got a racket, I got a bag, I got some balls, and uh, I went out for the tennis team. And I don't know if it was like the first day or whatever it was, but uh, after the tennis practice, I had my bag, and I'm sitting there waiting. And uh, of course, like there was like a girl I liked on the bench, you know, whatever. I felt I was like, you know, Brooks Jensen, and uh, my mom and dad show up, and now, I start. Is that, hold uh, on, is that the real reason that you decided of all things to go out for the tennis team was because girlfriend was on the tennis? No, team? I just I thought it would be fun to do tennis. So anyway, I start running to the car because my parents are there, and my bag, the uh, tennis racket handle was sticking out of it, and as I ran, I tripped over the tennis racket. I took a huge bump. Of course, the, you know, girl's watching, and so, like, I jumped up and went, I'm fine, and then, you know, kept running to the car, and uh, it's weird because I took this bump, but I was it didn't bother me or whatever, so I went home and, you know, just did whatever, you know, afternoon. And then it was time for dinner. And then we're eating dinner. And my dad looks over and he goes, uh, why does your arm look so weird? If you knew my dad, this would make a lot of sense. So I looked down at my arm and this fucking arm, it wasn't like totally at a 90 degree angle. Did I just say a word? This yeah. this funny, silly arm is bent at like 135 degrees. My arm was broken. So they take me. To the doctor, and uh, the doctor gives me the x-ray, and he's like, dude, your arm's broken. And uh, he goes, but don't worry, I'm going to I'm gonna break it back, and then we're just going to put you in a cast. And so my arm didn't even hurt. My arm was not bothering me, but it was broken. But man, when this bro broke my arm back straight again, that was the worst pain I've ever felt in my entire life. And then they put my arm in a cast. So we go home, and I got to be in a cast for like six weeks or whatever. But I'm like, bro, I was exercising. I was working out. I was making such great progress. What could I do with just one arm? So what I did was I did whatever legs I could do, which wasn't much. It was like that, you know, those benches, and they got that thing that you can like straighten your legs or whatever at the end. Yes. I could do that, <laughs> and, I could do, or the, and I could do wrist called. curls and reverse <laughs> wrist curls. That's all I could do. So, bro, I start, uh, I start doing all these wrist curls just with one arm. I start doing my legs and everything like that. And then uh, eventually I get the cast off. 
And I, I immediately, you know, you have a cast on, so your arm's like white. It's like completely white. And it's like all shriveled up and pale and uh, skinny. And then I had my other arm. And it was like, Doc, are they going to even out? And he goes, well, you know, they should. And uh, long story short, they never did. So oh, this geez. one has always been, and even like my, my, it's not even like just, you know, your forearm. But my wrists, I got the one wrist. And then I got the other wrist, which is like half the size. The actual bone is, uh, if you measured them both, like, you know, my my left wrist bone is like six and a quarter, and my right is like six and three quarter. The actual bone. So anyway, it is true that I do have one forearm bigger than the other, and that is why. Now, has any keen eye in a locker room ever pointed that out? Like, hey, boy, why you no. got that one arm that's a little bit bigger? Nothing like that. You're delivering a big overhand chop or something like that. It's far more vicious with the right hand because you, you got a little bit more there. But that was the end of my tennis career, by the way. They're asking when I started gymnastics. Well, actually, that uh, was the great benefit to you. If you're trying to put on weight, tennis is probably the worst sport that you could run yeah, around Yeah, that was the last the thing I needed clay. to do to put on weight. Yeah. So then I went out for wrestling, amateur wrestling. And yeah, I was, why did you never I do was, amateur wrestling? I did. I went out for amateur wrestling, seventh grade and eighth grade, and I was pretty horrible because I was a pacifist, and I was always afraid I would hurt somebody. It's not good to be an amateur wrestler when you're afraid you might hurt somebody. No. Bro, I got <laughs> smashed six ways from Sunday. But I was, uh, I did, uh, we were already doing the YWF at that point, and my buddy, uh, my buddy uh, Chris Kelly, his uh, cousin worked at a gymnastics place. And uh, we, in seventh grade, you know, they, they had you do this different stuff, and one of them was gymnastics. And uh, it was fun. And so, you know, Chris goes, dude, my cousin works at a gymnastics place. And so I went out and I started gymnastics. I didn't start gymnastics till I was, like, 12. And then I did that and wrestling. And the rest is history. Story time, everybody. I hope you love Fridays. Back in a moment, I got to talk to the FCC. Observer Live. I noticed on the chat here that some people are questioning my story, okay? Oh, yeah. So listen, I don't have a tape measure, but dude, if you're watching on video, watch. Left and then right. All right. Brian Edler is holding up his left hand right now. See where he's my wearing his watch? My fingers are almost touching. They're uh -huh, practically touching. see that? That's a noticeable difference. Hmm. That's a noticeable difference. You want me to go down and get a tape measure and measure for you guys? You've said that before, haven't you? So anyway, it's not the same. God, are you guys blind? God, it's bad enough that people are deaf. Now I have to deal with blindness on top of that? Yeah, it's a slow news day! <laughs> won't, be, won't be this weekend, though. No, no. Because no, we got no, a lot no. coming up. Yeah, we, we do. We got SmackDown tonight. Yeah. You know what's on SmackDown? Drew. Uh, Drew McIntyre's been announced for SmackDown coming up tonight. And uh, we got a full AW Rampage, which apparently has a fantastic match with uh, Andrade and Phoenix. Apparently they were told to go out there and have their pay-per-view match on TV because they ain't having it on pay-per-view. <laughs> and according to uh, reports, they did. So uh, that's apparently awesome. And then apparently a big uh, brawl at the end, which is a lot of fun. And uh, then, of course, on Sunday, we have Forbidden Door. So if you're a Twitch homie, twitch.tv slash F4W video, uh, we will be doing a post show. It will be available on all video platforms, all subscriber video platforms. You have to be a subscriber. Twitch.tv slash F4W video, which you can uh, sign up for using your Amazon Prime account. Just link it to your Amazon Prime. You get a free Twitch subscription every month. So if you don't use Twitch, you can use it for us every month, free. Get all of the uh, bonus shows. And then there is uh, YouTube, obviously, video.f4wonline.com. That's available. And uh, if you're a subscriber to WrestlingObserver.com, you can get not only the audio of the post show. If you like podcasts, 13,000 podcasts available as a subscriber to WrestlingObserver.com. You can help pay my fine. So get up there and check it out, everybody. That's it. Thanks, Mike. Callers and listeners, everybody in the studio. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.